our intuitions have trained our brains so that we're really, really good at finding a way to take bad arguments and hide the flaws. And so the past arguments that, if like for, for example, the ontological argument has fallen out of favor. Um, Alvin Pantinga came up with a modologic version of it and, and we've heard uh, some of that tonight as well. Um, but we're good at that. We're good at hiding the flaws. We're good at deceiving ourselves. If you expected uh, one side to show up here and present all kinds of hardcore evidence for the existence of God and the other side to show up with all sorts of evidence that there are no gods, uh, you, you came to the wrong place. In reality, uh, my view of this, and we've heard it phrased as positive and negative atheism, um, is that this is much more like a, a courtroom where there is a burden of proof, there is a base presumption. You've heard the reference to uh, presumptive atheism. And we're here to, to roughly establish guilty or not guilty, not necessarily to demonstrate innocence. Although that's a case that I'm willing to take up off hours, um, the, the case that in fact there are no gods. But when we look at these court cases, for example, how many people in this room believe that extraterrestrials are visiting Earth, abducting our citizens, and taking them away for medical experiments? That's, that's what I thought. Now, why don't you believe this? Do you, are you not aware that you can actually go and interview living, breathing people who will give you their first-hand account? This isn't hearsay. This isn't I saw this. This is what I actually experienced. And if experiential evidence alone, direct experience, was enough to be rationally justified, clearly these people must be. They will tell you their experiences. You can talk to many of them. Different people who have not interacted in any way that we can tell, and their stories will be very similar. So, you know, that we've got the little gray aliens with the big eyes and everything. Then you can talk to groups of people who will claim to have either been abducted or abducted by the same aliens or abducted at the same time, or just have seen UFOs and seen uh, people be abducted, et cetera. What, what do we make of this? Why is it that most people don't believe that? Isn't, I mean, are we not aware that, the, that there's things like the Drake equation that attempt to calculate the probability that life on Earth uh, how, how probable it is that life on Earth is the only life in the universe? And the answer is, oh my gosh, it's so absurd to think and arrogant to think that this is the only place that life formed. So clearly, we have lots of good reasons to potentially think that there are aliens who might be visiting and abducting people. And yet we don't, by and large. No of those people often are, are kind of shunned, uh, hopefully not too meanly. Um, and so, if you'll forgive me for actually addressing something about Christianity in particular, I'm not doing it to address the religion, but C.S. Lewis uh, has famously said that what you think about Jesus is the only thing that really matters. And he presented it in his famous trilemma that the only options are liar, lunatic, and Lord. And I not so humbly submit that C.S. Lewis was arrogant. That there's a fourth option that starts with an L, which is legend, which we heard a little bit about from David Fitzgerald today. Um, and there are possibly many, many more. So when we look at these alien abduction scenarios, are these people delusional? Are they deceived? Are they attempting to deceive us? Are they dead right? Are they dead wrong? How many Ds can we come up with? And the arrogance is assuming that we have the capacity and the knowledge at present to consider all of the options, this, this when you've eliminated everything that's, that's probable, whatever's left, however impossible, it must be the answer, is wrong because you can't achieve that. You can't eliminate that. What, what, when yeah. someone's arguing with me that the Earth is 5,000 years old, <laughs> yes, I'm smiling. Yeah, of course I'm smiling. You know, the, the, the fundamentalist view uh, of the, uh, you know, the creation of the Earth is rather like an episode of the Flintstones. Mm -hmm. So I, I, have, I have to laugh at those sort of how things. Does your, how does your atheism, which you're passionate about, mm -hmm. how does that play with your American audience, given that so many people in America are God-fearing people uh, and probably take exception to it? Um, well, but they shouldn't. We talked about this last time. Why, why should they take offence that I don't believe in their God or any other God? And I'd say to them, you know, tell me the reasons why you don't believe in all the other gods, and that's the reason I don't believe in yours. And I, I've got nothing against people believing in God at all, you know. Um, uh, in, in fact, if, if it, you know, did make you a kinder person, if you only did good things in his name, mm -hmm. then great, you know, but there's the rub. Uh, it's when... Uh, I see some of these religious fundamentalists saying that um, they've told their five-year-old children that if they turn out gay, they will burn in hell. Mm. That, to me, is child abuse. That's nothing to do with religion or spirituality. That's child abuse. So, 
that's why I'm passionate when it comes to that. What do you think that. of the... No, no, it, it, no, America's fantastic. It is the land of opportunity. And, um, uh, uh, and, um, th there's, there's, you know, bits of both cultures that I, I love and hate. And, um, uh, and the wonderful thing about being between, uh, England and America, they are both land of freedom. And criticize them all you want, but know that you're in a place that allows you to criticize it. Mm. And that's, and that's lucky. You know, and, and that's great, and that should be cherished. And freedom of speech for me is, is one of the most important things that, that you know, discovered. Mm. Uh, and uh, I'll fight for the right of it. And, and even though I don't believe in God, and I don't believe, you know, unlike most religions, I treat all religions the same. Mm. I, I think they're all um, r wrong, not morally wrong, but I don't think there, there is or could be a, a God. But if someone said, we're banning religion, I'd march to not have it banned, because it's your right to believe what you want, mm. um, and it's your right to be wrong, mm. and I'll fight for that right. Those people who would say, Dawkins, I believe in Jesus or whatever God they decide, and I felt the presence of the Lord. I have had that personal experience uh, in a way that whatever you say with fancy Darwin talk, I have felt it the way I felt this chair. Yeah. How do you respond uh, to that? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not impressed by that because there are a similar number of people who are Hindu, brought up Hindus and say, I felt the presence of Lord Krishna and etc. I mean, there, there, are, there are all sorts of illusions that the human brain is very capable of, of creating. And, That's um, an illusion. Those uh, people, are yeah. those people deluded, those people that say they have had a religious experience? I think they are, yes. Those people who say that we have experienced a miracle, that God has well, interceded in the world. So. Yes, most definitely. That, that's a delusion. Yes. But the well, notion that raising Lazarus from the dead. Oh, of course. I mean, I mean that, that kind of story happens so easily. It happens to, to this day. There are all sorts of people reporting miracles all the time. And, and we don't, you, you, you don't believe them because it does, doesn't happen to chime in with the religion in which you were brought up. Many people have criticized you when they read the God delusion. You, for example, you talk about the Jewish God and you say genocidal, homophobic, racist. Uh, you use very provocative terms. Well, that's the, the Abrahamic God, which is the God of the Jews, Christians, and Muslims, yes. Yeah, you, you are absolutely provocative on your descriptions. Uh, you, read Leviticus, read Deuteronomy. I don't need to, to do any more than just quote. But is that a, a caricature to take the worst uh, or the most fundamentalist, literalist readings of it as opposed to the thousands of years of evolution of all of well, those religions? Two, two things to say about that. One is that there are many people in this world who do take uh, the, the Bible or the Quran li literally, and literally do think that you should stone homosexuals to death or whatever it might be. On the, and the other, that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that even those people who don't say that, those people who have, as you say, evolved, have moved on. They have moved on for secular reasons. We've now abolished slavery. We now give equal rights to women. We now give votes to women. That's nothing to do with scripture. That's nothing to do with the Bible. That's come about in spite of the Bible. And people have now gone back to the Bible and said, oh, well, we'll, we'll leave out that bit. We'll leave out that bit. It Although some would say, some would say the, end, the abolishment of slavery was very much inspired by the Bible, even though slavery might have been the same. Well, you've I got mean, to be joking, Trump. because, because what, what you're saying is that you can, if you look through the Bible, pick a verse. You can probably find a verse that you can read as abolishing slavery. And then you've got another verse that says you should keep, keep slaves. So you're picking and choosing. That's all I'm saying. We don't get our morals from the Bible because we pick and choose on the basis of a modern morality which has evolved. You're quite right to say it's evolved. It's evolved for secular reasons. And now with hindsight, having evolved our morality for secular reasons, we can go back to the Bible and we can, as it were, rub out the bits that don't fit with our modern secular morality. Just don't, don't read them anymore, and that's what people do. It's, it would indeed. This, these debates have been going on for centuries, though, and uh, yes, I mean, you, you, actually will quote, persist. you quote Blaise Pascal, um, who talked about a wager that could be made uh, we, we're with a, a god that would actually allow you at the very last minute to make a deal with him, to yes. believe for a brief period. Um, and that wager would be, that what have you got to lose? Well, it's rightly called a wager because there's something rather hucksterish about it. And I'm not a Christian, um, let alone a Roman Catholic Christian, as Pascal was. And I'm also not a theorist of probability, as he was. He was a great mathematician. But I say hucksterish for this reason. His wager assumes two things. One, a very cynical... Um, and credulous God. In other words, a God who would say, well, 
I can see your mind working, and I know that you're wagering on me because what have you got to lose? So naturally, I'll reward you if you say you believe in me. I mean, why does that follow? Why wouldn't you think that's not a very good reason? It's not very good reasoning. It's not a very good motive. You might just as well be a god. In fact, you should perhaps prefer to be a god who would say, actually, I have more respect for the person who couldn't bring himself to believe and certainly wouldn't claim to do so in the hope of getting a favour. Yes, uh, that, we're, we're talking now logic and, of course, a jealous Well, not just god. logic. I think there's a moral change to this. Well, well, exactly, the, because the, there's an argument that the jealous god who, who would consign non-believers to hell is actually immoral, so why would you follow him anyway? There's actually a Sufi prayer from the Middle Ages that is addressed to the Creator and says, Master, or however these things are addressed, and, um, if I um, pray to you in the hope of uh, getting heaven for myself, you should deny it to me. And if I pray for you only in the fear of hell, you should send me there. Um, these would be bogus forms of belief. They'd be simply behaviorist, reward and punishment stuff, conditioned animal reflexes, um, coercive, and they'd require a slave mentality, which is my second objection to the Pascal Wager. It, it demands of us that we think of this God as <clears throat> a cynical, rather credulous, rather capricious opportunist, easily flattered and of ourselves as the raw material for a pretty cruel and meaningless experiment. Now, often we unbelievers are accused of being nihilistic and not seeing the lovely, deeper meanings of life. Well, what could, re what could really be more, more negative, more, more pessimistic, more, more, more cynical than, than the, uh, the attitude I've just described? She wrote that question, mm -hmm. and it was, what, if anything, would change your mind? And that's sort of the essence of the whole thing. Because I went, you know, of course, I went off, blah, 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 well, but if we found fossils frozen in the layers in the Grand Canyon, what if there was some way for starlight from stars farther than 6,000 light years away to get here in 6,000 years? Well, that was a good one, yeah. What if the Big Bang, the microwave background radiation, what if there's some way to get that there? And, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, as you may recall, if you watch this, Mr. Ham said nothing. Nothing yeah. would change his mind. So. Imagine if you're on a jury, I mean, or rather, you're accused of something and these guys are on the jury. What would you, nothing, uh, evidence doesn't matter to me, I'm good, you know. <laughs> like, it's really an extraordinary point of view and it wouldn't matter. Right. Except, uh, I mean, you know, these guys can, you know, do it, it's a free country, as we say. Uh, but they have a complete or uh, thorough curriculum where they indoctrinate young people. That's a big deal with them. They got DVDs and workbooks and quizzes, and uh, they look just like science tests. There's be electricity, amps and volts, and uh, mitochondria, and then at the bottom, and the Earth is 6,000 years old. Mm -hmm. It's really, and as I say, we just can't, it is not in anybody's best interest to raise a generation of science students who doesn't, that cannot reason that does, has no critical thinking skill. And that's where they cross the line. And they figure there was a collision with some object from outer space, which perhaps cast up such a pall of dust and smoke uh, that it cut off sunlight for a period of time, killed most of the plant life, and therefore killed most of the animal life. And what about the stars, the star of Bethlehem? Well, some people think it might have been Halley's Comet, which showed up at 11 BC. Do you believe that? No, I don't. It's because uh, there are so many other theories about it that there's no way of telling which one, if any, is right. It may have been entirely a, a pious fiction. We can't tell at this date. The only mention of the Star of Bethlehem is in a couple of verses of the Gospel of St. Matthew. That's all. There is no independent reference to the Star anywhere. Are you a religious man? No, I'm not. Why not? Uh, well, the easiest answer is I wasn't brought up so. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> but I mean, you are obviously a very curious man, and you have an open mind about everything. Oh, sure. And so you, what, you investigated religion and came to the conclusion that? Uh, no, I can't say I investigated religion with any particular interest, but I was interested in the Bible as a work of literature. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a two-volume book on that, but only as a work of literature as, as 
one of the earliest, if not the earliest, serious histories we have. The Book of Kings, the Book of Chronicles, the Book of Samuel, uh, and also as a repository of great poetry, uh, probably the greatest poetry we have, certainly the greatest early poetry we have, and also as teachings of rather excellent ethical, uh, of, of, of ethical statements. Yeah. The one thing that the Bible isn't, that some people seem to think it is, it's not a biology textbook, it's not an astronomy textbook. The first, the first chapter of Genesis, the first couple of chapters of Genesis, are uh, the 6th century BC version of how the world might have started. We've improved on that since. I don't believe that those are God's words. Those are the words of men trying to make the most sense that they could out of, out of the information they had at the time. You don't buy Adam and Eve either. No, I don't buy Adam and Eve either. Uh, but uh, it's undoubtedly a legend which has some significance, but it's not historical. What about the life of Christ? Well, Jesus. Well, this, of course, is in historic times. It's at the time when the, when the uh, Roman Empire was at its height. And the thing about it is that all the only information we have about the life of, of Jesus is in the Gospels, in the New Testament Gospels. There's no reference to him in any literature outside. There's one dubious paragraph in the histories of Josephus, which may have is that been... right? There's no reference to Jesus other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? And, of course, in, in, in the rest of the Bible, the, the, epistle, yeah, right. the epistles of Paul, Acts of the right, Apostles. Right, right. But outside the sacred writings, absolutely no mention. No historian who was not... Who, who, is not, who is not a Christian, let's yeah. put it that way. Not in Bethlehem, no one left any writings of any kind. None, none. This doesn't mean that he didn't exist. The chances are he did. There were many people at the time who were, what should we say, messianic, mm -hmm. uh, who were believed to be messiahs by one group or another. And uh, Jesus survived. In, as a Messiah. Incredible impact for someone who got such little notice at the time from historians, right? Yeah, that's true, but uh, that's, the way, that's the way sometimes it works out. Uh, when, when Mohammed also received little notice outside of Arabia, and uh, I dare say many founders of great religions were dismissed by people of the time, except those who believed in them. It's just one more kook. It's true that some people define God as pure consciousness or as being synonymous with the laws of nature. Uh, but if we talk about consciousness and the laws of nature, we won't be talking about the God that most of our neighbors believe in, which is a personal God who hears our prayers and occasionally answers them. So I just want you to be sensitive to this, because if Michael or I say something derogatory about Islam or Christianity, which seems possible, <laughs> response from the other side shouldn't mention quantum mechanics. And, and, it, and it shouldn't reference a, a, a notion of God that is so denuded of doctrine as to more or less be synonymous with pure mystery or pure information or pure energy or pure anything. Um, so I just want to, I wanted to plant a flag there where you all can see it. Because, because the God that our neighbors believe in is essentially an invisible person. He is a creator deity who created the universe to have a relationship with one species of primate. Lucky us. <laughs> and and he, he's, got, he's got galaxy upon galaxy to attend to, but he's especially concerned with what we do, and, and he's especially concerned with what we do while naked. <laughs> And he, he almost certainly disapproves of homosexuality. And he's created this, this cosmos as a vast laboratory in which to test our powers of credulity. And the test is this. Can you believe in this God on bad evidence? Which is to say on faith. And, and if you can, you will win an eternity of happiness after you die. And it's precisely this sort of God and this sort of scheme that you must believe in if you're going to have a, a, any kind of future in politics in this country. It, no matter what's your gifts, I mean, you could be, you could be an, an unprecedented genius. 
You could look like George Clooney, you could have a billion dollars, and you could have the social skills of Oprah, and you are going nowhere in politics in this country unless you believe in that sort of God. God is very definitely beyond the verification process of science. God has been designed to be beyond the verification process of science. This is one of the, one of the, the classic adaptations of religions, is to, is to create this gulf so that, so that science can't get anywhere near God. That's true. But science can understand that very fact. You say that well, science, can under, science can understand how religions evolved and why, by the way, that idea is completely absent in folk religions, which are the ancestors. The idea of, the idea of God being, as it were, beyond science. They don't make a distinction between science and religion. The, in folk religions, it's all the same. It's all one. This is just what everybody knows. And they have no concept of faith. They don't need a concept of faith. It's only once you start getting this separation between science and other things that people think they know when maybe they don't, that's when the idea of faith looms and becomes a very attractive idea. And indeed it is. It protects the idea of God from disproof. What would my father, the man responsible for my education, taught me that Islam, rightly understood, is a religion and philosophy of peace. In fact, he said that for any society to be peaceful and prosperous, it had to institute the rule of God or Sharia. I came to disagree with my father. It was a gradual process that started when I entered and lived in societies such as the Netherlands and the United States that applied man-made constitutions and laws. Both countries are peaceful and prosperous. I now disagree even more with my father that Islam is a religion of peace. When I look at the amount of security that is deployed tonight here, 6 months ago, the Boston Marathon was bombed by two brothers who invoked the founding document and the founding father of Islam. I disagree with my father when I look at the wanton killing of the Westgate Mall in Nairobi by Somali men invoking Allah and Muhammad to justify their horrid act. I disagree with my father when I look at the reports this week of 30 men and women worshipping in Iraq who are killed by a suicide bomber invoking the very same God and the very same prophet that they invoke. I disagree with my father when he says that Islam is a religion of peace. When I look at the 120,000 dead in Syria, Syria is now a stage of a proxy war between Islam's two most important and most influential nations the Sunni Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the Shia Islamic Republic of Iran. I disagree with my father that Islam is a religion of peace when I read about the almost daily reports of the destruction of churches, the pillaging of Christian property, the rape of Christian women, the terrible exodus of Christians and other religious minorities from Muslim countries. All this is done by men we invoke the founding father and founding documents of Islam. I disagree with my dear beloved father when I read about the teenage girl in Pakistan who's shot point blank in the head by a man invoking Allah and Muhammad because she wanted education. What Islam needs is not a denial of these overwhelming and compelling facts. Islam needs a reformation. Muslim leaders who are serious about achieving true and enduring peace need to revise the Quran and the Hadith so that there is a consistency between what the peace-loving Muslims want and what their religion says. We are now in America. Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf here tonight likes to compare the American Constitution to Sharia law. 
The Constitution is only 225 years old, and it has been amended 27 times. The Quran is at least 1,200 years old. It has not been amended once. What a shame. It is urgent and imperative to start these amendments. It's time to innovate, innovate, innovate. And I will do, ladies and gentlemen, what I can do to help. Thank you. Mr. Ramadan then went on, and I think this is an important thing to talk about, to immigrants. He did exactly the same thing that Mr. Glass did. He treated us as a society as if we were a society that just abuses immigrants, that imprisons them, locks them up. I don't know where he gets that from. I see immigrants all across our streets, many of, which, many of whom are doing very well. Most people in Britain have welcomed them. There hasn't been mass violence against these in immigrants. By and large, they have been welcomed. How does that happen? How would the reverse happen in Saudi Arabia? How would that, the reverse of that happen in any Islamic culture? Why is it that every Jew in the Middle East has had to go to Israel? Why is it that we have made the de facto agreement that if there is to be a Palestinian state, it has to be Judenrein, clear of Jews? Because we treat them by a different standard, ladies and gentlemen, and we know it, and we will not do what we need to do, which is to say this is what works, this is what works for us, and this is, we believe, what could work for other people. Mr. Ramadan said that we need dialogue. I agree. Everyone agrees we need dialogue. But where does it start? Would it start, for instance, with making a joke, contra Mr. Khomeini, not a very funny man, or would it start with an article, perhaps? Would it start, perhaps, with a film? It did, a few years ago, with submission, and Teo van Gogh was killed. Could it start with making a joke, perhaps? A joke in a cartoon? Well, apparently not because we know that uh, there were burnings and killings and lootings and riotings across the globe in reaction to those cartoons. If you're going to start a dialogue, what could you do that would be smaller than drawing a cartoon? If anyone has an idea, they, I, please let me know, but this dialogue which we keep on being offered is not reciprocal.